Welcome, friends, to the Enduring Gifts of Marvin Gaye podcast. Brought to you by your 26-year listening veteran, Jessica. Join me as we celebrate these enduring gifts, the songs of Marvin Gaye. In each episode, I will share insights about the music and recount life experiences tied to it. I'm hoping to inspire you to take a first or your 500 first listen to these songs that are truly the enduring gifts of Marvin Gaye. My last chance. Woo. Just listen to it. Oh, my goodness. Um, Such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. A delicate song. Um, The lyric, I'm just a shy guy. I'm so nervous, girl, but I've got to try. Pardon that. That was horrific, but that's the lyric. (laughs) Please believe only Marvin will do. Only. Marvin will do. That's at about two minutes, 45 ish seconds into the song. He's, he's at that, um, lyric. The first place that I was ever exposed to that song is from the Marvin Gaye collection, a box set of four discs that gets whipped out one day when I am up uh, visiting my cousins in, of all places, a very small town in North Dakota. Um, my step-uncle had this box set. Um, I, uh, why did it come out? Uh, I don't really think that I had yet shared with anybody that I was very interested in Marvin Gaye yet. I have definitely come across Ain't That Peculiar. Now, kind of, I think almost concurrently, which is why I was kind of pausing for a minute here to consider what should be the next song that I would speak about. And I'm really going to have to just decide these things. I don't, it's not going to have to be in complete exact chronological order because we are dealing with um, 26 years worth of history here. And I honestly can't remember the exact song by song order that I ever encountered these songs. But um, the Marvin Gaye collection was encountered when I was 14 years old um, that summer. So must have just been within months of me starting to um, really enjoy Ain't That Peculiar. I've, and then so concurrently, I think I had started to dabble into on my own from the home collection into what's going on. I do believe that the first album that I dabbled in was what's going on. And then we come up for summer vacation in North Dakota. And I do believe that this was one of the longest stays that I ever had up there. I know at one point in my youth, in those teenage summer months that I spent three weeks with them. And I think this might have been that time. Um, or maybe not. I, I can't honestly, yeah, I can't recall everything. It's, it's amazing how you can't recall everything, right? All of the nitty gritty details. Um, I had my appendix removed the summer of being 14. And, um, so that was a very traumatic experience. And then, I feel like, well, I know that shortly after that happened and it was still in summertime. So before I was back in school, I was up in North Dakota and the Marvin Gaye collection was taken out. Uh, and why I remember that is because I remembered showing my scar. Like, because, you know, it was fresh. It must have not very long ago happened. And then it was like, yeah, here's my scar. And then I also remember the Marvin Gaye collection, you know, like being in the the same room, right? We were listening to music and I was showing my scar and then the Marvin Gaye collection was brought out. Um, That was a very pivotal beginning of the game, beginning of deep 
exposure into the catalog of Marvin and and why I say deep is because it was a lot of deep exposure to unreleased material of Marvin's. Um, I'm looking at it right now. There's a beautiful, humongous booklet. The book is formatted in this beautiful um, square shape. Huge. It's got to be like an eight by eight diagonal. So, and it's filled with full page pictures and just some biography. So then it, it goes, there's four discs that make up this collection. And I just see it's come to volume one, 20 top twenties. It's giving you the songs that are on there filled with pictures. Volume two, the duets, it's got some pictures It shows you all the songs on there. This is the gem. Volume 3, Rare, Live, and Unreleased. So when I'm now thinking about that, I said May was when I found Ain't That Peculiar. And June is when I had my appendix removed. And then I feel like this may have been that three-week time that I was there in North Dakota. Um, so it's no later than the end of June, July, right? That's very immediately into the beginning of, of this journey and to at the immediate beginning in within a month of beginning the journey to be given exposure to volume three, rare, live and unreleased. That was what changed the game even though the game was just now starting but it changed the game to becoming like oh this is about to get real real you know what i'm saying like we're going in like i said we're diving off of the deep end here folks we're going in you are going to get like an exposure and it's going to create a connection to the beautiful soul of this man that he always is exposing through these songs. The songs are just exposures of his soul. It's not going to be possible. You're going to go through a journey of studying Marvin Gaye's music without having been fully exposed to his soul. Um, It's a soul experience of Marvin's. You are being exposed to his soul. Um, He creates from the soul and it's 100 percent vulnerability there is not an element of um, hold back that goes along with his musical creations so to a young impressionable teenage girl um i did share in an episode that i recorded that got lost that and it's it's crucial to point this out the last little bit of music that I was listening to before I started this journey was about the only little bit of music um, prior to Marvin that was very selective on my part, and it was New Kids on the Block. I took a very, very long time to join that bandwagon. I've explained already I refuse to be on bandwagons just because that's a really full bandwagon. Like, I'm going to be the judge of anything that I become hardcore devoted to. And so I resisted being a part of that movement. It seemed like that was going on in my, um, you know, the girls of my age, like my peer group. Like I just, I wasn't going there until I was exposed to it through my cousins, these girls in North Dakota that I'm now being exposed to the Marvin Gaye collection through their dad. A couple of years prior to the Marvin Gaye collection, probably about the age 11, 12, 13, I'm hardcore into New Kids on the Block, and that's it. You know, that's the extent of the musical um, sophistication <laughs> that's going on on, you know, my part. Like, leave it to me. I'm I'm a sucker for New Kids on the Block. So just a few short years after that, I'm thrown into some rare live and unreleased um tracks of marvin's it set the tone for just a a very deep connection to him in a way beyond an episode or so before where i was explaining there's some very um 
If I'm just going to give you a very high level, nothing deep, nothing more than some music trivia so you can answer some trivial pursuit questions, you know, I'm going to play you the million um, copy sellers, the, the I heard it through the grapevines, the couple of do ain't no mountain high enough, you know, duets with Tammy Terrell, the what's going on, the let's get it on, the um, sexual healing you know, mercy, mercy me. There's some just extremely humongous hits that he had that just crossed over and made their way, you know, onto mainstream, all radio. Somebody's heard that song once or twice before. Or, you know, if you're gonna try and get started knowing the artist and knowing Wow, that the artist process is a very soul deep, uh, vulnerable expression of himself process that is very um, wide ranging, very rich. You know, there's a very rich selection, and it's just it it is very very beautiful. Um, you could go there or you could go there. You know what I'm saying? You could go very high level or you could go there. And so the path that I took without, this was again, this collection, literally, I, when I say whipped out, I mean, I literally do mean that I, he, my uncle, my step uncle, he went over to this, uh, little shelf that their stereo sat on and he opened the shelf and he pulled out the Marvin Gaye collections. It's in this pristine beautiful box it literally is it's a box set and he opened up the lid off of it and he put in one of the discs and it was just everything and this is actually oh my god get yourself the Marvin Gaye collection I have a story I will try and make sure I get the story in of how and I actually received my own copy of the Marvin Gaye collection just how deeply important it was to me it is a rare collection um at the time I could not get my own hands on it for several years. Um, and I want to put this into context too, of kind of the importance of my process of how my process went about, because it's very different than, um, what anybody's process would be in this day and age. This was before internet. Like I literally don't think the internet yet um, existed on the planet or it was in its very early stages and you were rich if you had it in your home and we weren't there yet. So there was no internet. And even if there was the internet, there wasn't really, there was no Spotify. There was no Rhapsody. Um, I remember that finally the way kind of on-demand access to music on the internet began was through, uh, wasn't it Napster? And it was basically like illegal. So it was almost like anything that you were getting your hands on from Napster, you were at risk of like, if they found out that you had those files on your computer, you were like committing a felony crime. Like It was just like this really big deal to, on the one hand, appreciate like, the on-demand just access that you finally had to music, um, but you would just be into so much trouble if you were making use of it. And I remember at the time, my youngest sister, she went in deep. She didn't give a crap. She had so many songs. And I would just kind of look at her and be like, sis, isn't this like not right? Isn't this like illegal or whatever? And she didn't care. She had any and everything that she wanted and whatever did I want, let's look it up and let's get in, let's download. Like she was going in she didn't care about those restrictions um but so there was a time in music and in a time in wanting to enjoy music and a time in wanting to get to know music where you know what had to happen you had to spend money you had to go buy the music and you had to go somewhere to buy the music you had to buy it and you had to go someplace to buy it so it was not an on-demand um type of situation at all so back to how i said when i very first you know deliberately decided to start learning this music my first foray into it was to start exploring the music that was literally right in my living room it was had been there for my whole entire youth up until this point 
uh, whole entire time I lived in my childhood home, right? That music was always right there. Those purchases had already been made, right? And they were filed and on the shelf. And so it was a matter of starting to explore those things. And, um, you know, they were a lot of the huge uh, bestsellers. They were what's going on and let's get it on. And I want you, um, she did have here, my dear, there was sexual healing. Um, and I kind of think that those were the full on albums. There was this little greatest hits thing that was going on. Oh, there was live at the London Palladium. Um, I'm not trying to make it seem like it was a skimpy collection by any means, but it wasn't everything. It was definitely not everything. And then there, by the time that I had started to kind of get a little bit and a little bit more exposure, um, there was a knowledge of the gaps and a knowledge of the inventory that I needed to get my hands on, um, a knowledge of the, okay, I'm going to do my next babysitting gig because I need to get my next $20 bill because I need to get over to the um, Best Buy or um, gosh, there used to be this one store and wasn't Tower Records and I forget what it was called now, but it used to just sell books, movies and discs and they um, had a lot of the time inventory that Best Buy didn't have. I will say Best Buy was where I bought the bulk of my material, but there was this other store. They don't even have stores like this anymore. Um, but it was uh, the place where I was able to get the Marvin Gaye Live album from 1974, and I had had my heart set on that one for a long, long time, and it was never at Best Buy, and then one day, we just happened to be a little bit farther into the neighborhood, and stopped into that store, and I've quit. it didn't ever matter wherever, whatever music store there was available, the only thing I ever did is I'd walk in, and I'd go to the Marvin Gaye section of any music store, and... I went over to the section in the store and they had that disc and I was like, oh my God, I'm not leaving the store until I get the disc. It was a totally different um, story, it's a different album, different songs. I'm focusing on my last chance. So the Marvin Gaye collection, um, I get exposed to it two months in to starting my journey and I do believe that the first disc that my uncle put in was 20 Top 20s, which is, I believe, like I was just looking through the book here, is volume one, 20 Top 20s. And so that's a great exposure um, because it's the t it's exactly what the title says. It's 20 songs of Marvin's that were top 20 hits. So those are going to be songs that you most likely have heard at some point in your life on the radio but we i i feel like he kind of played that one and then i feel like he kind of went straight into rare live and unreleased um whoa dude you know that's this, this is like you're you're getting into your very high degree education level the doctorate level you're getting into your doctorate level material here because my last chance I don't even know. I'm looking at this book right now. Okay. I love you secretly, AKA my last chance. Joe Bett music written and produced by Marvin Gaye, 1972, previously unreleased, right? This isn't even a song that's on any album that I'm ever going to go over to Best Buy. And it's a track on an album that he released. This is a song that until you got your hands on the Marvin Gaye collection box set right here, you've never heard that song before. You can't even buy this song. This song does not exist on the internet. You can't just type in the name of the song and get it and hit play and start to be able to hear it for no fee, right? Um, this is a very, very rare song and very, very rare at that time. Right? The context of coming across rare music back in those days was all the more rare. It was all the more, what have you invested in? What have you spent your money in? What is a part of your musical collection that you had to purchase? And this is a gem because, okay, oh my gosh, dude, the Marvin Gaye collection. 
if you're like seriously trying to go deep and I didn't even know that I was trying to go deep like this. Do you know what I'm saying? It's another, it just, it's one of these, this was meant to be, this was going to happen the kind of the way that night Mercy Mercy Me just started to play on the television. One day I was up in North Dakota after my appendix had been removed and my uncle pulled out the Marvin Gaye collection and plopped in volume one. And then I just, I got my hands on it, you know, and I started to flip through the book and over the, I had to have been there for three weeks because I got completely into the collection and I was able, I know I came home with cassette tapes of the entire collection. So I had to have been there for three weeks. A part of this, and it's, it's kind of, it'll be maybe another episode, but I'll just uh, kind of can speak to it. Um, yeah, the only thing that I will say about it, because I will make an episode on it in the song. Um, when I lost my appendix, when my appendix had to come out, I'm trying to think. That literally happened the day that the pain started to happen first thing in that morning was the day of the funeral of my next door neighbor who had just given birth to her newborn baby and died as the baby was born. And so that was just trauma and tragic and horrible. And to this day is the saddest thing that ever has happened in real life to someone else that you know, right? Um, so that's happened no more than a week before this. And then that morning, my sisters and I are up because it's early-ish, you know, and it is summer, so we're all out of school, and we wouldn't normally be up this early, but we were all up because that was the day of the funeral. And so my parents had gone earlier that morning to go to the funeral, and we had kind of gotten up too, you know, and we're just kind of waiting for them to come home at the end of the day. And But it was a very sad day, you know. So, um, that happened. Then my appendix burst or was about to, my appendix did not burst, but it started to get really crazy. And then I had to go to the hospital and then I had to have it taken out. And then very shortly after that, I was up in North Dakota and, um, being exposed to the Marvin Gaye collection because, and what that all is a lead into is volume four of the collection called the Ballad Deer. And there was just a particular song on volume four that was really um, relevant to those events and the sadness of those events at that time. So the, I'll make an episode on that. But okay, in the Marvin Gaye collection book. So now I literally am looking at the book and I just turned the page. I had gotten to volume four of the Balladier, I turned the page. And then we get to the gold of this book, which in itself would be a reason to invest in this book. Hold on one second. I'm looking at, they do have page numbers here. Um, there is a um, discography, the Marvin Gaye collection, and then there's two pages of the albums of Marvin's in chronological order. Now, mind you, the previous episode, what was I just saying? Like I had gotten to this place that I wanted to start this journey, but I didn't know where to start because I didn't know the chronology and less than two months into the journey. Boom. Here it is. And it's beautiful because it's got, um, actual pictures of the covers of albums. Now, I don't think that it's every single album unless it is. I think it actually is showing a picture of every single album. Yeah, it is showing the covers of the albums along with the names and then the year released and every the name of every single song. It's just a beautiful presentation. And I remember that before leaving North Dakota, I also came home with Xeroxed copies of these two pages. Um, but I'm looking here and it actually, it isn't complete unless I'm missing a page. I think I'm missing a page here, two pages maybe, because I have taken some of the pages out of this 
book and they're hanging on my wall. The size of these pages are huge and the pictures are beautiful. And there are some of the pages that are just full page pictures of Mormon. And I have like two or three of them hanging up on my wall. So on the backs of those must be the um, continuance of this chronology. I mean, this book is, it is this collection, this book, it's everything. So, you know, this was aspirational and that was, that was a known thing. And so in the course of three weeks, right, I, I'm up there for three weeks and I come home. Um, like I said, I have enough time, but I have fallen in love. I have just been devouring this collection you know like I know that I went a lot deeper into listening to this a lot more than my uncle thought would be the case when he pulled it out and put in 20 top 20s um I don't even think he probably had listened to this whole thing as much as I did in those three weeks and I just I knew I was obsessed like I said happily we'll call it an obsession um made cassette tape copies of the four discs and on the 13 hour drive home had this music in my ear the entire time so my last chance um yeah that, that's a, a gorgeous gorgeous piece and i i love that i just saw that that it's 1972 marvin previously unreleased very gentle it's the most it's probably one of the most the most delicate song um, that I've ever heard Marvin sing, I recorded, um, not live, because he sings Jan very delicately as well. And that would be another song that I would um, highlight from this collection that's also on this collection on the same disc, um, Jan. Live from Oakland, Alameda, County Coliseum, Marvin Gaye, um, produced by Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye Live, 1974. So that one is not an unreleased album, but let's go back to how I was explaining kind of the process of getting your hands on music at the time. I'm able to hear that song via this disc right and i'm able to look at that and see that it actually is from a disc that an album that marvin released it's called marvin gay live 1974 and even let me get into the entire album chronology section a couple pages back i can see the album cover i can see the name and i can see all the songs this becomes a very coveted, I want this album, I want this album, I want this album. Well, they don't, they're not printing this album anymore. Um, you can go to the record store right now. You're not, and number one, you're not going to find the vinyl record of it in any just current day, current inventory store. You are going to have to go to some type of a vintage classics vinyl record store where somebody is possibly going to have a copy of that that they very slim chance are selling you know and if they are you know you're going to get it for like less than a couple hundred bucks number one if you're going to get your hands on the vinyl that's a slim chance right and that's where you're going to find that in the country um Number two, you can go to Best Buy, you know, because they're they're making discs, compact discs of Marvin Gaye's music. You now they sell his albums on discs, and for years, from the time that I know that it's an album that I want to get my hands on, I go to Best Buy, I go to Best Buy, I go to Best Buy once a month, once a month, once I get my little money, and that album is not available. They don't. They're not printing that album they haven't gotten around in the process of making compact discs out of marvin's albums to making this one yet so that is the reason why the day that i went into this newer um music store and i went to the marvin gay section and they had that disc I wasn't leaving the store without it. I didn't even have $20 on me right then because this was not one of the deliberate 
I have my money some adult please take me to the store because I can't drive so I'm totally at the mercy of an adult being in the mood to drive me 25 minutes away from home to the Best Buy to go look for the latest disc that I can add to my collection. We weren't on that type of a specific trip for whatever reason. We were just kind of out shopping that day and that's why we were up a little bit further into the area beyond Best Buy. We were not going to Best Buy and this was I wish I knew. I can't even remember. They don't have stores like this anymore and they closed it down a long time ago. Um, but it was it was it wasn't even competition to Best Buy because they didn't sell electronics and you know, everything the way that Best Buy does and they just happen to also have a music section. This place only sold music books and movies. And so I had that disc in my hands and oh my god. I I was not the I had a fit, right? I, I obviously had to have a little bit of a fit to just let the adults that were with me and it, I feel like I was with my step grandfather and my stepmom and maybe even my aunt um like there, I feel like there was a group of us that had you know descended onto the store but yeah I couldn't leave without that disc that day that had been way 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 too important one of one that had not been available and that would be the other thing about these discs too when they would come available in these stores um if you see it you gotta get it today almost it's you go in and you look through the stack and they might have one copy of any given album and uh, you're rolling the dice if you don't get it today that when you're able to come back next month that it's still there because if they would have it and it would not be there the next time that you went to look for it, they wouldn't necessarily restock it anytime soon. You know, it was kind of like a one and done. It's there today. Get it. Especially if there's only one copy of it today. Oh my gosh. It used to be stressful. It used to be like, oh, I need it type of an experience in order to expand your collection. And so when, um, yeah, I came across, of course, very early on, not because I found it, but because it was just here, we're listening to this now, the Marvin Gaye collection came out. Um, my last chance is just one of these very, to an impressionable young girl, never yet been in love, right? Never yet had your own one-on-one -on -one serious uh, romantic experience. It's every single thing that a young girl, a woman my age now wants to hear that line. I'm just a shy guy. I'm so nervous, but I've got to try. And it's coming from Marvin Gaye. And he, you know, he sings as beautiful as that. And Marvin Gaye is beautiful to look at. And it's just like, oh my gosh, Marvin was shy. He was a shy guy. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like at that very impressionable age to hear a man um, singing love songs that are very vulnerable and that are just very pure and sweet. And, you know, why is he singing? That was something that was unrelated. Like he just wrote this, you know, it's what the thing said he wrote. And it's like, so men say that they, they can say that type of thing and they can approach a woman in that way and they can, you know, express things like that. And it can very much kind of, uh, don't let me generalize like this. Let me speak my truth. It very much did set up for me an expectation of this is what I look for in love. This is what love is supposed to be like. This is what love experiences will consist of. This is what happy love is. Love is happy. Love is pure. Love is great. Love is wonderful. Love is romantic. Love is, you know, Marvin Gaye singing love songs. Let's go. You know what I mean? Like, and I only want to do this one time with the one person that I'm going to, you know, ever feel this type of way about. So it definitely, for the fact that I was the age that I was in the place that I was in life, I was a good little girl. The only thing that I mean when I say that is that just so happened that at that age, when I was at that age, and maybe I think I might have been a little bit younger. I think when I was 12, there was a peer of mine in that exact location, you know, so it was another summer vacation, was there um, another 
person's child was a part of the situation, you know, so there were, there was a group of us kids that were within years age of each other. And, you know, we'd all get kind of plopped together and play, you know? And so this girl had been a part of the situation for all of my childhood. And this was just now the however many time in summer that I was seeing her. And she had just remembered she was kind of very sulking and just quiet and wasn't playing the way she had always played before. And it turned out, and she was 14 and she was pregnant. And that's why she was just not really as engaged as she had been all of our childhood up to that point. So that's the only thing that I meant by saying that I was a good girl, right? Like I wasn't pregnant. I wasn't doing that type of stuff yet. So, um, like I said, I just, I was a young girl who hadn't had my first boyfriend and didn't have any firsthand experience with anything romantic like that. And so then at that age where those hopes and thoughts are beginning to formulate, you know, I'm being exposed to this type of beautiful, deep, passionate, uh, cause it's not just this song, but it'll definitely be all the rest of the, you know, the, the catalog. It, that's what he's talking about. And that's where he's coming from. And that's like the type of man that he is. And that's what he's singing about. And he's got like this gift from God voice that what he's deciding, the message that he is, um, sharing and making and, and presenting and giving is about beautiful, pure, faithful, um, vulnerable, open, expressive love. And that just really set me up to expect to have those types of experiences myself in life. You know, just not really thinking that it was about anything else. And so, you know, I have no disappointment that that was the way that I, you know, kind of set out expecting and hoping that things could be. But um, let's wrap it up by recounting Um, I want to point out, you can find the song right now. I just listened to it on Spotify. It's this many years later, right? Um, this is not, I wonder if there's a copyright on this thing where I can see when it was released. I think it's like 19, um, you know, it's early nineties, late eighties. It might be late eighties that this came out. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing a copyright on it right away. Um, but you can get your hands on a lot of the songs that are in this collection. I don't think you can get your hands on everything. There is something on the duets um, disc in here that I've never seen anyplace else still to this day. So, um, and I will say there are some takes of the songs that are on this collection that you can find the same song other places. It's not this version of the song. So this is a must-have collection to try and get your hands on. But it is I Love You Secretly, a.k.a. My Last Chance, written and produced by Marvin Gaye, 1972, previously unreleased. When I just listened to it on Spotify, it was some 20th century master's disc greatest hits thing it was a compilation and it was on there um so you can definitely find it and you can hear it um but it is a exposure to the pureness of the soul of marvin and just what if you can afford (laughs) to spend a lot of time listening to someone singing about beautiful love like that and you know not get your expectations dashed if uh, that doesn't happen to end up being your own personal experience (laughs) then you know this is going to be right up your alley because it will be um romance giving you know for your life uh, all you need yeah, you know, you know, approach it that way, especially, you know, if it hasn't been your first hand personal experience, get your hands on this song because it will satisfy everything that you might not ever come across otherwise. Enjoy. Well, friends, that's it for this episode. Did we have fun? I had fun. <laughs> Subscribe to our show so you never miss the enduring gifts of Marvin Gaye. 
And we're excited to announce that you can follow us on Pinterest at our page, pinterest.com forward slash Marvin Gaye underscore enduring underscore gifts. There, you can see our gorgeous picture boards for each podcast episode, among many others. These boards are full of images of Marvin, capturing key moments from each episode. We're making this a listening and viewing experience for you. So until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you.